So we needed another big world history event to motivate um, more big advances in computing that would lead to, lead to operating systems that would manage resources. This happened August 29, 1949. What was the big event? So a picture. Okay. So we don't have any history majors in this class. Um, okay, so this, this was the first Soviet atomic test. This naturally got the U.S. government and the U.S. people pretty worried. And it led to a huge investment in a project to try to detect Soviet bombers. Right? So that the fear at the time was that a plane would fly over the U.S., drop one of these bombs, and destroy one of our cities. So there was this huge project that actually cost more than the, the Manhattan Project to build what was called SAGE. And it's basically a system to coordinate all the radar stations to try to track one incoming bomber that would fly over the Arctic and drop a nuclear bomb on, on a U.S. city. This is very different from sort of what radar was used for in World War II, which is you know, tracking large groups of planes. If you missed one, that's sort of OK. Now that the Soviets had a nuclear bomb, and this was what we perceived as the main threat, you couldn't afford to miss one bomber. You had to, you had to see them all. So this was a huge project. Um, and it required you know, really advanced computing. So you needed to do this quickly enough that you noticed the bomber before it got too close. This was a huge investment. It sort of ended up not making much sense for this purpose, because shortly after this, they had ICBMs, and you know, the whole space race was motivated by not needing to fly a bomber to drop your nuclear bombs would be able to send a rocket instead. But huge investment led to lots of advances. In and this is what the program looked like. So this is the program for SAGE. Five megabytes is, is a pretty big program even today. Right? This is the, the very early versions of the Linux kernel were about this size. Probably somewhere in one of these cards, maybe there was a hanging chat. So the old way of running programs and the way you know, through, the, through the 50s was batch process. You would take your program, your big stack of index cards or paper tape. You'd take it to the computer center. You would wait in line, or if you were important enough, get to the front of the line because you were more important. And your program would run, and you would get the output, which might be a failure because there was some hanging chad, and you'd get a bill. This was not such a bad model. What's the biggest problem with this model? So what's, what are the expensive parts of this process back in 1950? Okay. Right. The programmers are cheap. Computers were expensive. Right. Pretty much the opposite of today. Right. So the thing that you didn't want to have happen was this super expensive you know, multi-million dollar piece of hardware sitting around not being able to do anything while people wanted to do computation. And the reason it was sitting around not doing anything, well, you've got your processor, but you also had data. And all these programs, as they, they got more interesting or more complicated, well, they needed to read data. And reading data is really slow. So how slow is reading data compared to processing? Compared to running one instruction, how much slower does it take to read, memory, read data from memory? OK, good, yeah. So if it's not in a, in a nearby cache, so when we say fairly slow, is it you know, 100 times slower than an instruction? Thousand times. So these are these are numbers that, as you get to be a more sophisticated programmer, you should have some sense of. These have a huge impact. And there's a essay that Peter Norvig wrote that talks about how to become a, a good programmer. And part of it is you, you have to understand these numbers that really impact how your programs run. And these are the numbers that that he had, which which was uh, 2001. So they're the absolute numbers are going to be a little different today. And they were certainly, the absolute numbers were hugely different back in 1950. The, the relative numbers are not actually that different. They probably haven't changed that much. If you've got a 4 gigahertz processor, right, that means you're doing 4 billion cycles per second, a quarter of a nanosecond for each cycle. You're not doing one instruction every cycle, probably. So this is probably a pretty good estimate for today. It's about a nanosecond for each instruction. Getting to memory is about 100 times that much. Getting to disk, now we're talking billions of times. You can do 8 billion instructions in the time it takes to read from disk. And if you go back to the machines in the 60s, 
that ratio was probably, probably not 8 billion, but it was probably at least in the millions. So during the time it takes you to read from this memory, your machine is sitting idle when it could have been running a billion instructions that could have done some useful computation. So that is really, really wasteful. So how do we solve that? What's the, the solution to not wasting your super expensive computer while programs are reading data? So what you want to do is instead of just sitting around waiting, you want to use that very expensive processor to run some other program. And that was what was initially called multi-program. Right? The idea was you're going to run some program. So here's program A. At some point, program A says, I need some data. And then you know, maybe that's going to take a million cycles. Instead of just waiting, what you want your very expensive computer to do is start running some other program. So you're going to switch in some other program, start running program B. At some point, program B is going to get to a point where it needs some data that it doesn't have. Or maybe program A's data is ready. But let's keep things simple for now, right? So at some point, program B needs some data. Program A's data has come back, and now we want to switch back to running program A. So this is how we make the best use of our hardware. Right? We want to have the computer doing useful things for other programs while one program is waiting for its data to come back. So how do we actually do that? Right? So if our goal is to be able to allow multiple programs to run, right, they're going to share one physical machine, but we want to make good use of that machine by switching to another program when we're waiting for data. What are all the things that we're going to need to do to solve that? Good. OK, good. So we need something that can decide which program runs. We need some, some notion of something that can choose which program should run. What else do we need? OK, great. Yeah, so we need some way to know that when program B runs, it's not going to mess up the work program A was doing. Right. So we need some way to isolate their memory. One way to, to think of that is, well, remember what, before we went to this model, right? each program ran like it owned the whole machine. Now we're going to not own the whole, whole machine, but we want to give the illusion that we still do. Right? This is really what the process abstraction is about. It shouldn't be up to the programmer of program A to worry about what might happen if program B runs in the middle. It should be up to the operating system to provide this abstraction. So the programmer program A can write the program like they own the whole machine, and it will execute as though it owns the whole machine, even though it's actually sharing all these resources with program B. What are the other things that we need to make this work? So I think we've touched on a couple. Are there other big things, problems we need to solve to be able to do this? Yeah. OK, yeah, so we would like it to be the case if program B crashes, it doesn't cause problems for program A. And memory isolation gives you that to some degree. There are certainly things you know, that the early implementation of multi-programming still assumed all the programs were friendly. Uh, you know, they were all people that were trusted running programs. Um, you could probably do things that would cause harm to the machine that uh, none of the other programs would, would be able to recover from. But the memory isolation is, at least for the uh, standard kinds of mistakes you could make, is protecting the other programs. That if, if program B crashes, its memory is isolated from program A, and it shouldn't impact program A. So there's one big thing that we haven't really talked about yet. Maybe it's, it's been alluded to. But um, yeah. OK, yeah, so we might need some way for our scheduler to be able to tell program A to stop and switch to, to program B. We might not, right? We might say at, at this stage, um, and, and it was actually pretty late in operating systems history where you had a way to preemptively stop a, a program. It was up to the programs to, when they did something like request data, that would hand over control back to the scheduler. Um, you didn't necessarily need a timer, but it seems definitely it would be useful to have a timer where the scheduler would get a chance to, to switch which program is running. We're getting into sort of, sort of more details before getting the one really big thing that we need to enable all of this. So what's the one big thing we need to enable all of this? And, and all these things that sort of being able to kill a program, that 
sort of implies the thing that I'm trying to get at, but I'm hoping someone will say it. So once we move to this model, are, are all programs the same? Right, so we need some program that's going to be special. Right? And the reason we need some program that's special, well, in order to provide these two things, we need some program that can choose other programs to run. That means it's got the power to load a program, make that program execute, switch to that program. We've also want to support me memory isolation, which says program A can't read the memory of program B. Well, if we want both of those things, we need at least one special program that can, can read the memory of other programs to switch them in. Right? So if you didn't have a, a special, more powerful program, you couldn't actually do this context switching. You couldn't provide both isolation and scheduling. In order to be able to control which programs run and keep them isolated, we need some special program. In the multi-program days, this was, was called the supervisor. Today, we usually call it the kernel. It's a program that runs with special privileges. And what it usually means is it has complete privileges to the, the hardware. Right? So you still have access to the complete hardware from this kernel or supervisor, but it limits the access every other program has. 